coffee, I guess. Um, it's good to see you guys. I, uh, I'm just kind of curious how many of you have, uh, were able to actually go through and cut back on your Facebook time, cut back on your news feeds. And, um, <clears throat> how many of you actually found that to be really encouraging yesterday as, uh, I did for myself. I, uh, my, my bride and I had a wonderful afternoon uh, yesterday and just spending that time not wrapped up around um, what's actually happening um, or what's what's perceived to be happening, what people are saying are, is happening. And, and to really spend my time focusing on the Lord and and considering his will, his purpose in my life. Um, and then and then even just focusing on being around engage with my bride uh, while we're at home and and able to talk and communicate and spend that time together um, and talking about things not um, not totally uh, not really related to the immediate um, things but more looking at it from God, God what do you want from us where, where what is what does this look like if we were to be really passionate about you and about your word and about those things so hey good morning Steve isn't that interesting uh, how difficult it is to actually unplug from all that stuff? Um, now, I, in, it, I just want to be honest with you. I did look at my cell phone. I looked at Facebook twice, once in the morning with you guys when we were finished. And I checked it last night just to see kind of where we're at. Um, and then I did go and watch President Trump's uh, address to the nation. I did watch that. And um, just because, you know, I, I think it's, at this point, it's important to stay connected. And, and to know what's happening, especially with the, you know, with the church stuff of what what's next, when um, when can we expect these uh, the the parameters to be changing and how to go about that. So I am watching that kind of stuff, um, but it was especially good for me. It was just it was a really, really good day. Good morning, Mom. See you, Kathleen, Kay and Dick Olson. Good to see you, Don and Cindy. Good to see you guys. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I hope that 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 challenge or what I was going through yesterday, I hope it was encouraging to you guys. I hope you found um, the ability to, to take a break um, and maybe disconnect and maybe you need to do it today. Maybe maybe part of what God's doing is he's just he's incrementally moving us to that point where we can really disconnect from the, the noise of all the stuff going on around us and plug in and and. and, and latch a hold uh, to what it is that he's doing and and find that peace and that joy in there. So hopefully you guys are experiencing that and um, Lord willing, you can continue that. Um, as I still don't have Facebook on my phone, I'm going to actually practice that right now and, and leave Facebook off of my phone and really only look at it when I'm on my computer and try and specifically schedule that time. So it's in the morning or in the evening and, and cut back a, a, you know, on how much I'm doing on that. So good morning, Leslie. Good to see you. I see Candy, Francie. Good to see you guys. Uh, thanks for jumping on with us uh, here this morning. And uh, I, I'm we're going to be in Psalm uh, 12 today and, and looking at some of that stuff again this morning. Hey, good morning, um, Scott Call. Good to see you. I see Amanda Faulkner. Good to see you guys. Um, uh, Oh, nice. Yeah, Amanda, nice. Baby steps. Absolutely. We got to take our time to get off of that stuff for sure. Uh, good morning, Pam. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, hey, I do want to remind you, if you guys uh, get a chance, go to our YouTube channel, look up, go onto YouTube, look it up. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. We are, um, we're almost halfway there of being able to get our own URL, which means it, it'll actually just say Liberty Lake Church uh, uh, it, with a YouTube link, it'll be uh, much simpler for people to find right now. It's a pretty elaborate thing. So we're trying to get to a hundred subscribers so that they'll give us, uh, our own Liberty Lake channel. Um, so if you can, that would be great. If not, we'll just keep doing what we're doing and it really won't matter, which is all right, I guess. Um, Man, today, uh, I am excited to have you in the text today. I'm excited about Psalm chapter 12. Um, it's interesting. I was uh, chatting with uh, one of my buddies, Craig. Uh, actually, he's one of the elders um, at our church, Liberty Lake. And we were talking this morning. And his bride was there as well. But we were talking uh, this morning about how in the Psalms, it just seems like the same story. You know, it's the same melody, same same tune. And, and as you as we read the Psalms and we continue to, to dig into them, there are slight changes, but it's so often a very similar tune. And, and this morning's really no different. It's it's a it's an interesting perspective from King David as he's wrestling with his um 
his situations, his life. And one of the things that I, I'm wondering is I'm, as I'm reading this, I don't actually have it listed for sure where all the details on the dates are. Um, it, in my Bible, there's, there's nothing referencing the specific date when they believe that the Psalm was written. Um, however, it, what's interesting is you align this with any of the difficulties that he has in his, in his life, right? From being chased by Saul, um, to his sons chasing him, to his enemies attacking him, uh, uh, to to dealing with sin, and it, it, I mean, just all of the all of the th things in uh, David's life where he's stumbling around and and, and just struggling to to be the man after God's own heart that we see um, in the text here. Good morning, Julie. Um, you know, you just wonder where this psalm fits into that category at times. Um, but the reality is, as much as it would inform us as to his circumstances and maybe where his heart's at, we can see some of those key things jumping out of here. And we're going to look at uh, two of those aspects this morning as we engage with Psalm 12. So turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 12, and we're going to begin there this morning. As I get a drink of my water from my Liberty Lake Church coffee cup. Uh, <clears throat> so, Psalm chapter 12, verse 1 says this Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone, for the faithful have vanished from among the children of men. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all the flattering lips and the tongues, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are with us, who is master over us? Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from their, from this generation forever. On every side, the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of men. I don't know about you guys, but there's times where I read this text and I'm thinking, man, was David living with us? Was I mean, was he? Did he see this? Did he? Did he understand the condition of of our? culture in this day and and the reality is he does understand it because what we're really talking about here is the heart of men it's the it's the issue of of the darkness of uh, the lost of of us without Christ and and even even as we belong to Jesus we, if we read his word and we wrestle with this this truth the reality is is that even in that moment our hearts can begin to um well, we can begin to see that, that we're still struggling with some of that. There's still darkness in us. There's still elements of the old flesh. I shouldn't say darkness because there's, there's not, but there's there's still elements of the old flesh that wears up and that, we're, that, that we war against in where we desire to do the things that are against the character of God. And I was... I was thinking it's interesting that he says the faithful have vanished from among the children. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor with a flattering lips and a double heart they speak. So the, it's this idea that that the people around him are they, they are talking about being followers of the Lord, but then they're lying to their neighbors. They're they're talking out of both sides of their mouth, if you will. He says heart. But they say one thing to one person and then they say something else or they they're 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 much like the James talking about being being double minded where, you know, one minute we, we want to follow the Lord and the next minute we're following our flesh. And so that's the heart condition that we see here that David's crying out to the Lord. And part of me, I just wonder if if because I do this from time to time where I'm, I wonder if he's not thinking and, and looking at his own life and going, ah, Lord, look, I, I, this is me. I say this. I I. I, I want to live this way. And then I notice in my own life that I'm living differently. I'm living in a way that violates um, your character and your purposes for me. Much like our generation today, much like our hearts today that, that tend to wander, that tend to tend to move away from the Lord. The, the verse that really grabbed me this morning, all of that is, is, is there's all kinds of different aspects of this that we could probably apply to our lives. You know, are, are we the kind of people that flatter with our lips? Are we, do we make great boasts? Um, do we lie to our neighbors? Do we say one thing, but live another thing? Um, do we actually in our hearts wrestle with the, with this idea of who is the, who is master over us? Who's actually, who actually is over us? 
Um, I think we do. I, I honestly think that that's one of the real challenges. But in verse chapter in in chapter twelve, Psalm chapter twelve, verse six, he makes a really really amazing statement, and I, it just grabbed my heart today. And I want to, and not like literally, I'm I'm doing fine. Um, but it just really grabbed me, and 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 I want us to take a minute and dig into this and wrestle with what this means. Um, verse six, he says, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. I wonder if we, excuse me, my allergies are just going crazy, you guys. <clears throat> um, I, I just, I, I was wrestling with this. Good morning, Randy. Good to see you. I was wrestling with this today saying, Lord, is your word like pure words to me? Are, are they pure? Are they, are they without, without flaw, without any blemish? Do I see, do they see them like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times? Do I look at them and do I see them as pure and as valuable as silver refined seven times, which, which I'm assuming the reference to seven here um, is, gives the, it, the picture of being a, a, a complete, uh, purified to pureness, purified to completely done. Um, do I see God's word that way? Do do I engage the text as if it's the pure, purified, perfect, flawless word of God, and and allow that to penetrate my heart and to transform my thinking and and to engage in in life transformation. Um, like we see in Romans 12, you know, that we would not be conformed to the image of the world, but we'd be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Do, do we really, do we really value the word of God in that way? And in my head, as I was wrestling with this, I thought, you know, that's a great question. And how would we evaluate that? How would we, how would we understand if that's actually how we engage with the word of God or how we see the word of God? And my thought is we will do a little comparison. We're going to, we're going to compare a couple of verses and you have to do your own work in your own heart on this. You're going to have to be, do an honest scorecard and we won't post it on Facebook. And I mean, unless you want to be really honest about it which I'm trying to be as, as honest as I can. You can, you can throw yourself under the bus with me. But I want to look at a couple of passages, and we're going to ask ourselves, do we like that verse? Does our lives, do, do we allow our lives to live that way? Do, does, when we see this, these texts, um, does, it, does our life change to line up with that text? Are we changing how we live to be in a, Cord or in oneness with that particular text. So the first one, and you guys, this is great because this one's going to be safe. I promise um, everybody's going to be able to say, amen, praise the Lord. I love that verse. That's a great one. Let's stop here, right? Um, well, as soon as I tell you what the verse is, then you'll be like, oh yeah, I love that verse. Go to John 3, 16, right? Three, uh, John 3, uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Most of us know what this verse is. Most of us love this verse. When we hear this verse read or we see it uh, uh, up on the sign, even at a football game, we're like, yes, that's a great Bible verse. I love that verse. This is so cool. Look at, look at what it says. I'm going to read it so that I don't butcher it, but I'm also going to include verse 17 because I think they all go together. And there's more, but, but for the sake of time, I'm going to just grab these two. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Right? We love that verse. That We're like, amen. God loves the world. God sent his son so that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. God sent his son to save the world, not to condemn the world. We love that. Do we believe that? Does it change how we live? Does it affect how we live? I think it does. I, I think we're okay with that verse. I think we, we gravitate to that one. We go, yeah, Lord, that, that's awesome. I love that. Uh, that. That works. Good morning, Michelle. Good to see you. Well, this is where I think, if, at least if you're honest, like I'm trying to be with my own heart, this is where I start to kind of go, Okay, I like, I mean, I, I like John 3, 16, and this next verse is a little bit more challenging for me to really put my head around and to say, yeah, 
I, I live this verse out. This verse affects my life to the point where it daily is true in my life. Um, and that's Luke chapter 9. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. Now you're going to say, Shane, we've read these verses before. Well, we have. You're right. If you think we've read these verses, you are correct. We have. In fact, we've read them within the last year, I believe, um, because of what the text is and, and, and what it means and how we're wrestling with this in our own personal lives. But look at Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed. And when he comes in his kingdom, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, we take that text, and uh, good morning, Bill and Sue, good to see you. We take that particular text, and we, we, we take the question that says, let him who follows me, if anyone would come after him, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. The challenge in that text is, right, take up your cross daily and follow Jesus. We talked about this, uh, I think it was a few months ago, this idea of taking up the the, the object of your death, the, 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 the representation of your death. So we are dying to ourselves daily. We put, we take the, the fact that we are crucified with cross and we remind ourselves of that daily so that we will follow Jesus. So we put our preferences, we put our will, we put our desires, we put ourselves as being in charge of our lives. We put all of those things, whatever that is, and we put that aside, willingly laying that down, willingly, purposefully saying, I'm putting this away. I'm, I'm, I'm dying to myself today so that I can follow Jesus and live a life that reflects our love and our, and our faith in him to the point where we would have to address uh, an issue of shame if we don't live so out loud in our faith. How's that one going on a daily basis? How I'm like, well, yeah, most days, seriously, most days, um, I, I want to live that way. But ha, ha, do I get up in the morning? Do I value the word of God so much? Do I, do I take this, this text so seriously that every morning when I get up, I say, God, I want to die to myself today. God, I want to follow you today. Today is the day that I'm going to recognize that I am dead to myself. I have been crucified with you, and therefore I'm going to live a new life, a life that's in, that's that's impacted and directed by you. Um, the reality is, is that I don't think I do. I want that, but it hasn't. It doesn't have the effect in my life. It, it, what I'm saying is that I value this, but I clearly don't think I value it as much as I should. Because when I see this text, when I engage in this text, I, I start to see flaws in my own life and failures to really take this seriously, to really engage this and say, this is how I'm going to live because the word of God says that this is how I should live. Now, I don't mean, I'm not trying to beat you up. I hope, I hope, please understand this is in my heart. I want to encourage us to pursue the word of God, to engage the text, to acknowledge, God, I don't. I don't see your word for what it should be. I don't, I don't value it the way that David talks about it in, in Psalm 12, about how, this idea of it being pure words that are so pure, they're completely purified. It, it, and it's, it's, the, it's like silver that's purified completely. It's that valuable. It's that important to me. And that's my hope is that uh, this will be an encouragement for, for you and for me to, to, to re-engage the word even more deeply, even more passionately, more intentionally. This week, as we consider what our view, how we interpret, how we apply, how we value the Word of God. The, the last passage is this, and I apologize, you guys, at least for me. I picked this one because it was, it just is kind of hard. Um, and I don't do this well. I, 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 I'll be honest with you guys, I'm, I'm kind of at, I'm at a, at a point where it's in Matthew chapter five, you might as well start turning there. It's the Beatitudes and there's all kinds of different things to choose from. 
from anger to lust to divorce, oaths, um, how you love your enemies. I mean, there's just all kinds of options in this particular text for us to read it and go, do, do we really, does this really change how we live? Is, do, we, do we see this text and do we allow it to permeate our hearts and to, to actually rule or reign over our thinking and, and to control our tongues or, 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 or all of the aspects of our life? And, and <clears throat> this one here really grabbed me. Um, because it, 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 in my heart, it cuts to the real pride and self issue of my life. And it's Matthew chapter five, starting in verse 38, starting in verse 38. Look at what this text says. You have heard it, that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Did did you, okay, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other one, the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, my natural response to that is, hey, there's some wisdom in this. There's there's wisdom in life that says we're we're very careful. We don't we don't do that. We don't. If somebody sues me, I don't I don't let them take my my tunic and then give them more. Uh, you know, we definitely we would we'd never do that. Um, somebody that slaps me on the right cheek, uh, I, I don't turn the other cheek and say, here, this one needs. You know, here, here, would you mind making a match or something? I, I'd look better if both were red. I don't. We don't, when we, when we look at this, we, I think almost immediately in my own heart, I'm like, well, well, okay, Lord, that's not possible. You, you can't live that way. It would be unwise. Um, and, and, and almost to the point where we would immediately discount this, but this is Jesus himself. This is Jesus who all throughout chapter five is taking the practical application of the law and he's driving it down to a heart issue of selfishness and idolatry that reigns in the heart of man, that rules our lives to the point where, where, where we can hate our enemies, we can, we can deal with lust, we can do all of this stuff, and as long as nobody knows about it, as long as we keep it, keep it hidden, Somehow we think we're okay. Somehow we think that it's not as bad. And yet what Jesus is saying is that God sees the heart. He sees our intent. And we're supposed to live in such a way that reflects who Jesus is and how he lived. And the hardest part is that Jesus actually lived out this passage. He, he really did live this way. And, and it, he died on the cross for you, for me, for the world, for, for in, in obedience to his father. Um even though he wasn't guilty. You know, if I were to be the one telling you this, if I were to say, hey, you should live this way and you should live selfless, selflessly and you should you should give to those who are treat, mistreating you, you should, uh, you know, turn the other cheek, you should do all these things, you would wisely look at me and say, Shane, you're really not very bright. And that's not an intelligent way to live. And um, yeah, no. That would probably be a wise thing to do. But the problem is this is Jesus who's written this. This is Jesus who's pointing out the issues of the heart. And then he goes to the cross and he gets slapped. He gets beaten and executed unjustly. He's falsely accused. And he comes back from that situation. He comes back from the grave, living, alive, having defeated death and, and, and conquered sin and done all the things that he did. And he came back and he said, follow me. I'm going to extend this grace to anyone who will repent and follow me. Even though he was mistreated, even though he was uh, abused and, and wrongfully killed. So when you read that text, when you evaluate that in your heart, you know, if, I, if I'm if i honest, I, I really like John 3.16. No question. That one's easy. 
I can almost put my head around Luke 20, Luke 9, 23 through 27, die daily to myself. Yeah, I, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. I should, I should live that way. But man, when you get to a text like this, when you get to a text that says treat, you know, even people that are treating you poorly, go the extra mile, do the extra thing. The, the go the extra mile uh, situation, it was common in that time for a Roman uh, soldier to, to stop somebody in the street and give them their bag or their stuff and demand that they walk with, you know, that they carry their stuff for a distance. And I, I can't remember what the, what it is. I think the mile was kind of the idea that, that they would do it for that time. And then they'd find somebody else and, and let the individual back is my understanding. Jesus is saying, do it for two. So if he asks for one, give him two. If he forces you, did you see that? The text actually, verse 41 says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Would we live that way? You guys, my neighbors get grumpy about stuff and I start getting pissy about it. I start getting all upset, uh, salty, I guess. Salty is a better word. Isn't that, a, that's a better word, right? Um, uh, it, it seems less offensive, I guess. Uh, but I, I start getting a bad attitude about it. Because my neighbors are doing something I don't like, or or they're mad at me about something, or uh, the other day uh, I saw somebody burning a big huge brush pile, um, not not right here in our area, but just you know a little bit outside of our area, and and I've had the fire department called on me twice for doing a, a burn pit, and in in one of the I mean it's I'm, I'm burning old dry wood that's that's been seasoned for years. Well, I found myself I'm like ah you know unjust this isn't right i don't know what are you gonna do with that what are you gonna do with this text how do we how do we take what how david viewed the word of god in psalm 12 and apply it to the bible and then to our lives i think it the the reality seems to be that what God is drawing us into is such a deep relationship, such an intimate relationship that we would treasure his word, that we would treasure our time with him. We would treasure our relationship with him. Do you guys know what I love? Do you know one of the, one of the things? Let me say one of the things that I love. I need to say this right because I love my bride and I'm learning to love my children. Um, but the reality is I have other things in my life that I'm passionate about, right? Anybody? Yeah. So can you see it? Any? That's what. That's one of the other things I'm passionate about. I love my cars, and I and I'm I'm a big fan of Ford. And why? Not because I, I I honestly don't think that they're better than any other vehicle. It's just they're the ones that I know, and it really drives my dad nuts that I'm a Ford fan. Which, by the way, happy birth! My dad's birthday is on Friday, so I I'm 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 getting ready to try and remember to call you and say happy birthday. Um, but hopefully it's on video now, so you know I'm thinking about it. But the reality is, is that I'm passionate about this. I know things about Mustang and about Ford and about Ford trucks. I know lots of things about them and I'm, I can go in and work on their engines and do all kinds of stuff with those vehicles. Why? Because I'm passionate about it. They mean something to me. It's important to me. Brothers and sisters, is the word of God important to us? I hope you're not just depending on me to give you something to eat out of the word of God. Because we're called to be self-feeders. In fact, it's interesting when you think about shepherding and leading the sheep to green pastures, you can't force most animals to eat. I mean, you you may be able to some there we used to we used to tube little calves with a bag of milk and you know, that was hor that was never fun for the calf. I don't I don't think any one of them ever enjoyed that. But when it comes to really feeding, the green pasture is, is just, you're being led to that so that you can feed. And, and we have the green pasture. We have the pure word of God that's, in, that's available to each of us in multiple translations on multiple devices. Are we treasuring that? Are we delighting in the word of God? And I, I think that's, that's kind of the point. David sees the word of God as pure and wonderful and, and, and as valuable as silver. And it should be something that we consume, something that we delight in, something that we passionately pursue. And yet when we read texts all throughout the Bible, if we're, if we're honest, when we read these things, we're kind of like, yeah, I like that, but man, I don't really like this one. 
and and there's times where we as Christians become though that double-minded that that the people that speak out of two hearts because on one hand we say we love the Lord on one hand we say we love his word and and we want to follow it and we like these verses and then we read another passage that's hard that convicts our heart that calls us basically idolaters and we tend to walk away and ignore it I want to challenge you today to put Put, put the rubber to the road. Let, let's, let's actually put down some effort. We say that we are children of the word. We say that we're children of God. We love the Bible. But I want to encourage you today to engage in the text. To go, and go, go grab Matthew 5 and just read Matthew 5 today and wrestle with it. Confess where you are unwilling to surrender. Confess where you're unwilling to die to yourself and to live in obedience to what God's called us to be. Or maybe you're just struggling. Maybe it's just a point of weakness and you're going, God, I, I want to live this way, but I'm not. Help me to live in a way that, that shows, that reflects, that I value your word, that it's important to that I treasure it. I want to encourage you to engage the word of God. It is a gift from him. It is a pure word. It is valuable. It is precious. It is living and active. And it will change our lives if we engage it and if we surrender. May God bless you today and uh, keep you as you seek him, as you pursue him today, and as you grow in your passion and, and, and your, your desire to be in the word. God bless. I love you guys. We'll see you tomorrow at 10.